Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here. Um, I guess I should start by introducing myself. I know Nicole did um, a good job, but I should at least pronounce my last name correctly. <laughs> so my name is Sarah Suaidan. This is how it's pronounced. Uh, I come from Lebanon, all over in the Middle East. Um, there isn't really much to say about me anyway. I'm just a freelance front-end developer. I love CSS, I love teaching, I love writing. And so I've combined both into writing tutorials and articles, most of which have been about CSS, um, like CSS regions, CSS shapes a lot. Maybe some of you know some of my articles. I've written um, two for a list of parts recently. And I also write them, well, I write them on my blog, obviously, my very simple blog. Uh, I also write for Code Drops, where I'm an author and team member as well. And that's pretty much it. There isn't really something else to say. I guess I should also add that this is my first conference talk ever. So, yeah. Thank you. So I'm really excited to be here, really nervous. And yeah, I guess I should just remember to breathe. It's really, really awesome. You know, what's really great about this is I, I finally have the chance to talk to someone or to a bunch of people about something that I, re that I do and that I really like, and they're going to, be, to, to actually understand every single word I say. Yeah, I, I'm sure most of you, if not all of you, have been through it, talking to someone who's not tech savvy about web design, and they're like, and sometimes they're like, and then just move away. It happened, it actually happened. So it's really great to be here. Um, on the subject of understanding every word, I'm going to say I think I should uh, give you a heads up. Um, we, us Lebanese, tend to use certain words that have no equivalent in English. And one of these words is the word in no. I'm, I'm giving you a heads up because it just happens sometimes involuntarily. And if I do say one of these two words I'm going to mention, you can either ignore them or just know their meaning. Uh, the first word is enno. It, it, it actually has no meaning, kind of. We just put it in there, in, in the sentences. And it's mostly used in the context when you're saying something, an idea, and you want to elaborate on that idea, and you, you don't know how to do it, so you just, um, or you, you do do it, but in order to, um, okay. The way to connect the idea to its explanation, you just throw an inno. And, and in between. Now, you may not realize it, you, might not, you may not notice it, but if you do notice it, just know that I'm going to be elaborating on something and explaining more. Another word is bas. Bas is the Lebanese word for but. But with a single T, not two. Okay? Yeah. So if I do say bas, just translate it to but and you should be fine. As long as it's, well, but. Okay, so I'm here to talk to you today about styling and animating scalable vector graphics with CSS. Now, scalable vector graphics, as defined in Wikipedia, are an XML-based vector image format for two-dimensional graphics with support for interactivity and animation. They are basically uh, just tags that render images, and these images have support for interactivity and animations. Now, the interactivity and animations can be added using JavaScript, maybe using some backend language. I'm not sure, because I'm, I'm tot I totally suck with backend stuff. And you can also add it using, uh, using CSS, and that's the part that I'm interested in for this talk. And just like many talks about SVGs, I should go over why SVGs are really awesome, because they really are. Um, SVGs are accessible. They are accessible to screen readers if you make them accessible. I have a slide about this at the end of the talk. Uh, they're accessible in the sense that they have a very accessible DOM API, and they're accessible to us developers through the inspector or the web, uh, the dev tools of whatever favorite browser you're using. You can inspect SVG nodes just like you would expect HTML elements. They have very good browser support, starting IE9 for most of the SVG features and all modern browsers. Um, because SVGs are basically text, they can be gzipped and therefore have smaller file sizes than their PNG and JPEG counterparts. They have built-in graphics effects like blend modes, filters, clipping and masking, among others. So basically just Photoshop in the browser, which is awesome. Uh, they are interactive and stylable, the part that I'm going to be focusing on. And they have tools. There are tools for creating SVGs, animating SVGs, manipulating SVGs, optimizing SVGs. Three of the most popular tools for create, creating them are Adobe Illustrator, which works in all, for, uh, on all platforms, but it's not free. A very decent and fairly popular alter alternative is Inkscape. 
And Sketch is also an alternative. From what I hear, it's really good, but it's Mac OS X only. So if you're stuck on a Windows like me, you're not going to be using that. So no matter what SVG editor you use, none of them exports really uh, optimized and clean code. Most of the code that is exported usually contains um, editor met metadata, comments, um, empty groups and empty elements and stuff like that, and basically just a bunch of junk that you can remove safely without affecting the rendering of the SVG. So it's, so it's generally a good idea to use a third-party, standalone optimizing tool uh, to, uh, to optimize the code for you. Because, you know, before, I'm talking about this because before you want to start actually styling and animating SVG, you want to have something clean to work with. So there are many tools out there to optimize SVGs. Um, I'm going to mention two of them. One of them is the SVG editor by Peter Collingridge. It's an online tool. It allows you to either import an SVG file or just copy paste it. Uh, it offers a lot of options that allow you to optimize your SVGs and clean up the code. And what's really nice about it is that whenever you check an option, an optimization option, you get to see the result of applying that application to uh, that optimization to the SVG directly live in front of you. So it helps you make better choices on what optimizations to make and what not to. Uh, it can help slash your file size by a lot. For example, this very simple path that I've, uh, that I've uh, optimized, the original file size is highlighted. It's, it was 1.1 kilobyte. It's, it's a very small file. But it was slashed down to 0 0.6 kilobytes. So optimizing your SVG code, code is a really good idea. If you don't want to use an online tool, you can use this SVGO. SVGO stands for SVG Optimizer. Uh, it's a Node.js based tool with, with a very simple and nice, actually, um, a very simple API, drag and, no, not API, a very simple drag and drop GUI. So if, you're not gonna, if you don't want to use an online tool, you can use this one. It's really nice. This is a very quick example. I think, um, yeah, it's the same path that I showed in this slide. I exported it from, from Adobe Illustrator. Now, Adobe Illustrator gives us a lot of options to optimize and customize the code and clean it up, kind of clean it up. But even after cleaning it up in Adobe Illustrator, I, I was left with the, the code on the left. And after optimizing it in Peter's tool, you can see how much the file size is a lot smaller, a lot cleaner, more readable in general. Now, after you're done with you know, optimizing the code, uh, you're probably going to want to clean up a little bit more, some manual stuff, and give classes to your, uh, to your selectors or uh, elements. If you're exporting the code from, uh, from Adobe Illustrator and you're separating the styles from, from the markup, uh, in SVG you can add styles to, an, to SVG in different ways. I'm going to go over them in a minute. But when the styles are separated, you have, well, inside the style sheets, you're going to have to se select and target an SVG element. And of course, you're going to use ID selectors, class selectors, etc. The generic names uh, produced by Adobe Illustrator and, or any other uh, SVG editors usually look like this, ST0, ST1, ST2. They make no sense whatsoever. So you're going to want to change the class names into more semantic ones. So now that we have some clean code to work with, um, it's time to talk about adding styles to SVGs. Now, the dividing line between HTML and CSS is clear. HTML cares for content and structure, and CSS cares for the looks. However, in SVG, the line is blurred, to say the least. An SVG is an image that is marked up and that has styles. So things are just mixed up into one thing. You see, SVG 1.1 did not require any CSS, and therefore it was necessary to present the styles using what is known as SVG presentation attributes. Presentation attributes basically provide a shorthand way for applying a CSS property to an SVG node in the form of an attribute. You, for example, you have this fill, stroke, stroke width, among many others. You can set the opacity like this as an attribute, transforms, apply transforms, etc. Now, a subset of all these uh, present SVG presentation attributes can be set using CSS. However, not all of them can be set. For example, you cannot, if you have an SVG node inside an SVG file and you want to change its height and width, you cannot do that via CSS. You're still going to use presentation attributes for width and height. But a subset of all SVG attributes can be set using CSS. Some of these are shared with CSS. There are CSS uh, properties equivalent to the presentation attributes, and there are SVG, oops, sorry. 
And there are some presentation attributes that are SVG only. The, the table shows a list of all presentation attributes that can be represented and, and applied using CSS as CSS properties. Now, because many of the presentation attributes are implemented as CSS properties, you can set them using either inline styles, just like you would any other CSS property, using document styles embedded or using external style sheets. Um, if you're going to embed them using inline styles, it's going to be inside a style attribute. So instead of using the full stroke and stroke width as, pre as presentation attributes in this example, I've used them as CSS properties inside the style attribute. You can also use style tags inside an SVG document to embed the styles. And the styles will be just like normal CSS. There's a selector, there's a style, and you just apply it. Now, a note about the C data block that you can see, that you see here, um, it's not always recommended, but because some of the uh, selectors in CSS, like, a child's, like the children's selector, which is an arrow or a chevron, I don't know if it's the correct uh, thing to say. Um, yeah, so that arrow can, um, Well, it could basically cause problems with the XML parser, okay? So sometimes it's recommended that you use it, but you don't always have to use it. If you, if you optimize the code using, uh, using Peter's SVG editor, it's, it's, it's automatically removed. So you don't always need it. You can also embed the styles inside a style tag outside the SVG in an HTML5 or XHTML document, um, as you see here in this example. And you can use, last but not least, an external style sheet. If you have an SVG document and you're going to import an SVG style sheet, you're going to have to use the XML style sheet element or tag to do that. Style cascades. Now, because, um, because SVG presentation attributes are implemented as CSS properties, they do uh, contribute to the style cascade in CSS. But presentation attributes count as low-level author style sheets and are overridden by any other style definition, external style sheets, document style sheets, or inline styles. The example here, the circle, I've used the fill attribute with the value blue to give it a blue background. And then I've used it as a CSS property inside the style attribute. And the, the, the pink color inside the style attribute overrides the blue one outside. The diagram on the right shows the order of the styles in the cascade. Uh, styles lower in the diagram override those above them. And you can see the presentation attributes are up above. Uh, the only style sheet that does not override presentation attributes is the user agent style sheets. Uh, now, inside any style sheet, um, you just a note about the talk. Um, I'm going to be focusing about concepts and stuff you should know or would want to know if you're going to apply styles and animate, uh, uh, animate SVGs. You're not going to see any really impressive demos or effects. So, inside the style rules, rules uh, okay, the selectors that you can use in CSVG. Not all CSS selectors can be used to select SVG elements. This is really important because I've tried using, for example, the direct, the, direct, the direct sibling selector to select an element in SVG. It didn't work. I've tried adding, just for demonstration purposes while I was preparing the slides, I tried using the before and after studio elements to add generated content. It doesn't work. So these, uh, these selectors and the slides, all of them work. Maybe, possibly, um, some extra uh, selectors could be added later. Uh, however, if you want to know more details, you can always visit the specification. The, the link at the end of the slide links is, goes to the specification. Now, a very simple example I got from the iconic icon set. It just shows you that you can style an SVG and tr apply a transition to its, uh, to its properties just like you would with a CSS apply to an HTML element. Um, in this example, the light bulb is made up of gray dashes or strokes or paths. And when they are hovered, the stroke width increases, the color increases, the, the stroke color, uh, not increase, the color does not increase, the color changes, and the background color fades in, giving it an effect of lighting, uh, you know, getting lit. So, and you can see how in the DevTools you can inspect every single line of these lines of the light bulb, and down at the bottom I've highlighted the before and on hover styles. You, cha you change them just like you would change any other CSS property. Now, embedding SVGs. There are different ways to embed an SVG in a, in a document, and this is relevant to the subject of this talk because 
the technique that you use to embed your SVG determines whether or not this, any external styles, interactivity, and styleability will be applied to the SVG or not. Depending on the technique, some of the stuff that you apply may not work, and you may get a headache trying to figure it out if you don't already know that. I know I did. So there are different ways to embed an SVG. The first one is using an image tag, just like you would use any image. Using an image tag, you can do that with SVG as well. Uh, for security reasons, many browsers are going to be to disable external styles, um, interactivity, and scripting on an SVG when it is embedded using an image tag. The same thing applies to the sixth one. I should have reordered these, by the way, but it's okay. I kind of like jumping back and down, up and down. So this, the, when you're when using an SVG as a background image using CSS, which is number six at the bottom, the same thing applies, just like with an image tag, no external styles will be applied, no interactivity, no CSS animations. You can also embed an SVG in line. This is, that's number five. In line, using an SVG tag. I think this is one of the most popular ways to, uh, that we, we're using today. SVG, the SVG tag, using an iframe and using an embed tag and using an object tag, which means that uh, two, three, four, and five are going to preserve styleability, interactivity, and CSS animations. Now, the most, uh, the most suitable of all these four techniques, um, I wouldn't say the most suitable, uh, but the SVG in line, embedding SVG in line is really nice if you're willing to drop some backwards compatibility. Uh, the, ob uh, the iframe is okay, but if you use an iframe, then um, controlling your SVG from the main page where you're, where you're embedding it is going to be a little hard. Uh, the embed tag has never been part of any uh, specification. So, but it, it's, it's widely supported because it's used for embedding some, some kind of content that rely on a, on a plugin like Adobe, like Adobe Flash. And the object tag, the object tag is, is one of my favorites. It is my favorite because it allows you to provide a fallback image between the opening and the closing object tag. So if, the, if your SVG image cannot be rendered for any reason, the browser is just going to render the fallback in between. So this table shows just um, which the techniques and whether or not each one supports um, or preserves links, external styles, interactivity, and CSS animations. There is a note here that if you're going to use an image to embed an SVG, the CSS animations applied are not going to work. However, if you use SVG animations, they are going to be preserved. So I have an example here, a very simple example. It's bearcss.svg. It's basically a bear with a fish in his hand. Very happy he's going to be eating it. So I've added an animation just to animate the fish a little. It's trying to, it's try, it's trying to you know, uh, get away, because no one likes to be eaten by a bear, of course. So I've added the animations in the first example using CSS animations. And then I embedded it as an image, the one on the left. And I've used the, the one on the right, embedding it as an object tag. The CSS animations are not preserved on the left. They are preserved on the right. And I've added a hover interaction to the image. The hover interaction is preserved if you're using an object tag. And it is not preserved if you're using, if you're using an image. OK, then I've recreated the same example. But instead of applying, instead of using a CSS animation to animate the fish, I use the animate transform element, which is an SVG animation. And then I embedded, as a, uh, embedded it as an image, again, here on the left. The SVG animation is preserved, but any other interactions on hover are not preserved. So this example, the takeaway here is, is that CSS animations are not going to be preserved if, if you use an image tag, but SVG animations will be preserved, but without any interactions. Next up, responsifying SVGs. Now, SVGs, usually when you export them from an SVG editor, an SVG has a height and a width. And any element, be it HTML or SVG or whatever, if you specify a height and a width, it's not fluid anymore. So featuring this section is a really nice owl. It's a very happy owl. Um, I'm not a cat person, so you won't be seeing any cats in my presentation. Sorry about that. Yeah, so. I have this SVG of an owl. Uh, when I exported it, it had a width and a height. So the first step to, to responsify your SVG is to remove the width and the height and to add the view box if you don't already have it. The view box is very important because the next step, you're going to want to preserve the aspect ratio of the SVG as you, as you resize it, as, as it shrinks or expands. You want the aspect ratio to be preserved. However, without the view box attribute, the preserve aspect ratio has no effect. 
So you, you need to have both. Now, the preserve aspect ratio can take one of many values, and the value that you're most likely going to be using is the x-men, y-men, with the keyword meet. Basically, what this value means is that the browser is going to resize the image while preserving the aspect ratio, um, expanding it enough so that uh, the entire view box of the SVG is visible within the viewport, and it's going to be expanding it as much as possible while, while preserving the other two um, options, or no, restrictions. Okay. After, okay, now that we've set all the SVG attributes, removed the ones that we don't need and added the ones that we do need, we're going to embed and wrap it in a container. Now, because this is just a wrapper, and no, it doesn't, ha it doesn't really have any semantics, we're probably going to be using a div. I've given it a class of my SVG containers. Now, SVGs, as we mentioned before, can be embedded as object, image, or inline SVG. The technique, this technique, this responsifying technique, by the way, responsify should totally be a word. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, if selfie got into the, the dictionary, then yeah. So you can use any embedding technique, and this is still going to work. Okay, so after you've wrapped it in a container, you're going to apply the padding hack on the container. Now, how many of you are familiar with the padding hack? Oh, not, not a lot. Okay, so basically the padding hack allows you to give an element a width and a height. It is a hack, however. You're going to, to see that it is a, like a really hack. It's not a technique that, well, we should have a standard way in CSS. The, the idea behind it is to give the element a height and the width while preserving a specific ratio of the height to the width. Now, the way this works is, the, height is given a, the element is given a height zero because we want to be able to give it a height that is, um, that is relative to the, to the width. So first, so first we're going to give it a height zero. We're going to position, to give, any, to, give it, to, to give it a position relative. This is going to create a positioning context for the SVG. We're going to talk about this next. Now, the width can be anything you want, depending on where you want to put it on the page. You want to give, you want to give it a full width, half width, whatever. The width is anything you want. And the padding top is the SVG height, the one that we removed before, over the SVG width time the, times the width value of the container that you can set for, to whatever value you want. Now, the reason behind re using padding top to expand the element is that the padding top is set relative to the, when, when you're using a percentage value to specify the padding, the, pa the top and the, the bottom padding, the percentage is set relative to the width of the element, not relative to the height. So when you're specifying a padding, be it a top padding or a bottom padding, or a bottom, bottom padding, using percentages, that padding and that height that we're going to get is going to be relative to the width, and so you're going to be able to maintain a specific ratio. Now, the idea is to give the SVG container a, ra a ratio of height to width that, that, that is the same as the ratio of height and width to, of the SVG. Oh my god, I'm totally... Okay. So, in this, for my example, for owl.svg, uh, the padding top is 300 over 300 because the height and the width are both 300 times 100, which is the width I've given it. I've given it a full width. And you get a 100% padding top. However, if the width of the, of the container is, for example, 60%, if you don't want to give it, if you don't want to expand it uh, to the entire width of its container, the padding top is going to be 300 over 300 times 60, which gives us 60%. Now, if the owl, now in this case, it just happens that the owl, the owl image is a perfect square, height equal width. But if they are not equal, for example, if it has a 250 uh, width and a height of 400 pixels, the padding top would be calculated by. Dividing 400 by 250 times 100, and that would be 160 percent. It's all just basically, it's basically just math. You use the padding hack and give it the values depending on the height and the width of the SVG. That's just, it's very simple. And then you position the SVG inside the container. We've given the container a position relative because, well, the height has been collapsed, the container has been collapsed, and we've given it a padding so the SVG is not going to be in where you expect it to be. It's going to be pushed down by the amount of padding that you've given the container. So in order to push it up again, you, you give it, you use an absolute value. No, you use position absolute and just 
put it at the top left corner of the element. Now, width 100% for the SVG is only required if you're, if you're embedding it using an image tag. So it's basically just math and then a padding hack. And then you just resize. This is my favorite part. I do this for almost every website that I visit. I have to resize it. That's the first thing that I do. Yeah, it's, it's really fun. So animating SVGs with CSS. Now that we know how to style SVGs, how to add the styles, and um, how to embed them, we're going to, you're going to choose, if you're going to apply CSS animations, you're going to choose a CSS, uh, an embedding technique that allows you to preserve these animations. Now, most of our animations, like the really impressive ones, are going to have some kind of transforming, transformations in it. So SV, SVGs respond to the transform and transform origin properties, just kind of just like an HTML element would, would do, but there are some in, inevitable differences. First of it, the first one is that the transform origin on an HTML element and an SVG, an SVG element is different. If you have an HTML element, it has a box model, so it has a padding, margin, it, it, it has a box model, but, 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 but an SVG does not. So the transform origin, the default value for the transform origin on an HTML, ele on, on, on an HTML element is 50% by 50%, which is the center of the element, which is what you'd normally expect. However, if you have an SVG element, like a circle or a rectangle, the transform origin is set to zero, zero. Zero, zero, zero is the top left corner, not of the element itself, but of the SVG canvas, of the entire SVG canvas. So if you're going to rotate an element, this is, most, uh, this is usually obvious, uh, the, the transform origin is mostly obvious when you're rotating an element. So if you have a div, an HTML element, and you have an SVG rectangle, and you rotate, apply a transformation, uh, rotate it by 45 degrees, the HTML element is going to be rotated around its center, but the SVG element, the rectangle, is going to be rotated around the top left corner of the SVG canvas. So in most cases, you will want to change the uh, transform origin of an SVG element and place it at the center of the element. You'd think that this is very simple, but it's not. First of all, setting the transform origin on SVG, well, it is simple in a sense, technically it is simple, but because we're now living in a perfect web world and because of all the bugs that we get, that's, uh, well, it sucks, it basically sucks. So you can set the tra transform origin on SVG elements using percentage values or using absolute length values, like pixels, for example. If you set them using percentage values, the value is set relative to the element's bounding box, which includes the stroke used to draw its border. If you're using absolute length values, the origin is set relative to the SVG canvas. Pretty simple. Now, so if we're going to, if, you, if we get, go back to the same example, we have a div, an HTML element, and a rectangle in SVG, and we set the transform origin to 50%, but by 50%, 50% on the rectangle inside the SVG, it is rotated around its own center, okay? Because we're using percentage values. Heads up, the, this is the first bug. Transform origin issue in Firefox. Um, basically, setting the transform origin and percentages in Firefox on an SVG element does not work. It is a bug. It has been filed. It should not be a problem if you're not rotating anything, but it will be a problem if you are. So you will want to currently, at the time being, just use absolute values to set the, uh, the, the transform origin on an SVG element. This is a very simple example, a pinwheel. Uh, don't look at it too much. I don't want you getting dizzy on me. So in order to, rate, to rotate it, I've used a percentage value for Chrome or for WebKit to set the transform origin, and, and I've used absolute values to set the trans transform origin and to make it work in Firefox. Okay, so this looks simple. Just use percentage values and absolute values for Firefox. However, um, five days ago when I was working on the slides and I was preparing this demo, um, I was zooming in and out. I was zooming out because I wanted uh, to take a smaller screen recording to add to this slide. And as I started zooming out, I got this. <laughs> the element is not transforming around its own uh, center anymore in Chrome. If you're using transform origin in Chrome with percentage values, which do work, try not to zoom the page in and out because it's gonna mess everything up. Yeah, this is also a bug. I talked to Dirk Schultze from Adobe and he filed the bug. He said that it should be fairly simple 
to solve, and that it may, may be solved, uh, fixed, not solved, fixed before my presentation, but I think it, it, it didn't. So yeah, zooming in and out in WebKit, Blink does not maintain the transform origin at the center of the rotating element, and it's a bug. In Firefox, it does not happen because you're using absolute values and the, the transform origin is set relative to the entire canvas. Zooming in and out causes no problems at, at all. So for the time being, just use absolute values till all the bugs have been fixed. Another heads up is hardware acceleration in Chrome. When you're applying CSS 3D transformations to an HTML element, they are automatically hardware accelerated in Chrome. Um, however, if you're applying these transformations to an SVG element, they're not. Just that. In Chrome, they are not. Firefox does apply some kind of hardware acceleration for uh, transformation, CSS transformations on SVG elements, but in Chrome, it's, it, they're not hardware accelerated. So if you do see some you know, flickering and all that, it's, it's normal. Just they're not hardware accelerated. My last section, animating SVG paths. I can't believe I made it this far. No, honestly. Okay, so animating SVG paths. Um, there are different effects that you can create if you're going to, anim uh, to animate SVG paths. Um, actually, SVG paths are one of the most powerful features of SVG. You can create some really impressive effects by animating them. One of the most popular recently effects is by creating an animated line drawing using, uh, using CSS. Now, you can do it in CSS, but in order to animate an SVG path as if it were drawing, you know, as if you were drawing itself, has, have many of you seen um, the Xbox, I think it was, the Xbox website? I'm not sure, just ignore it, okay. To animate an SVG path and uh, have it like draw itself, you need to know its exact length. If you know its exact length, it becomes very simple. You just set the stroke dash array and dash offset to the path length, which you know already, apply a transition, and, for, and then on hover or click or whatever, you just set the st stroke dash offset to zero and the line is going to animate itself. It's going to start with no line and then it's going to be animated as if, it, as if you're actually drawing it. Um, this is a very simple example. Now, in this case, I, I've downloaded this SVG. Um, I just started uh, trying uh, different values because I, I didn't want to use JavaScript to animate it, so I just started trying different values, and it turned out that the value 4,000 was enough. So I just applied it, the stroke, uh, dash array, and dash offset. I gave them the 4,000 value, added a transition, and on hover, the city is just lit up. And then the, the lamp is animated. Um, the full color of the inner lamp changes, and I've added a gradient, which transitions, animates um, very smoothly. Of course, um, the light, um, lighting the lamp up happens after the line animation were, uh, finishes, so there is a transition delay applied in the inner lamp um, animation. Transition is in six, six seconds. Oh, yeah, six seconds. So I've waited till the animation of the line was finished and then I've lit the lamp up. Well, like I said, there isn't really any impressive demos here. However, there is one impressive demo I found online, which is this one. I found it on the um, GD studio. It's, I think it's a French studio. The really nice thing about it is the, the flame is first turned off. You click it and then anima an animation starts. Now, you can recreate this animation using CSS if you, know, if you know all of the lengths and you just play with the values of the delays and it's really, it's very possible. Yeah, so. The, the animation is very slow on PowerPoint. I think, yeah, it's an issue with PowerPoint. Okay. Now, in most cases, if you want to create an animated line drawing effect, you may not know the, length, the, the absolute length of the path, so you will want to retrieve it using JavaScript. There is, a, uh, there is a method in JavaScript to retrieve the path lengths. It is path.getTotal, it is get total path, get total length. Okay, that's the method. And then you just use JavaScript to set the track dash, or dash array and dash offset just like we did earlier. So the, the whole idea is just to know the path length and then the, set the stroke dash array and dash offset to that length and animate it. 
Okay, so if you want to know more about these techniques, about the how-tos and how it works, <laughs> yeah, I suggest that you read this article by Jake Archibald. It's a really excellent one. You, it, it has an interactive demo in it, and it's very, very simple. You, you, I just recommend you read it if you want to know more about this. Now, another way to animate SVG paths is by morphing paths, where you start with one shape and you finish with another. Now, you don't need to know any path lengths in this case. Uh, you just need to know the starting shape and the finishing shape, and you just animate them. However, this is not possible in CSS. There is no way in CSS that you can specify a beginning path and a finishing path, and possibly even intermediate, intermediate paths, to, and then animate them. There is no way. I think there should be a way. So I hope that someday we get a way to do that. This, uh, this effect that you can see is the Mac OS X Genie effect created by Manuela from CodeDrops. It's one of my favorite uh, SVG path animation effects. It's really great. So you see you start with a narrow shape and then it morphs into a full width, um, just rectangle. So yeah, the idea is to create an SVG path uh, with one path to morph and to morph it into another one. You only the first path, the second path, and possibly intermediate paths if you want your animation to go through specific um, shapes in between. And there is no way in CSS to animate one SVG path into another at the time being. Okay, so in order to do that, if you want to be able to manipulate SVG paths, I recommend you use the Snap SVG library. It's very, it's awesome. Uh, the website describes it as being, it, it makes dealing with SVG nodes as easy as jQuery makes manipulating the DOM easy. Okay. And now, animated SVGs can be used as GIFs replacement. This is one of my favorite things. Um, I, this code, this code, not code, this code, um, I found it on the Oak website, the Oak Studio, and in this article, uh, the link to the article is at the bottom. The writer says that by using animated SVGs instead of GIFs, we were able to reduce our page size from 1.6 megabytes to 389 kilobytes and reduce our page load time from 8.75 seconds to 412 milliseconds. That's a huge difference. It's, it's really great. So if you ever can use SVGs for simple animations instead of using a GIF, then by all means go for it. And before I finish my talk, uh, it's really important not to forget, don't forget to make SVGs accessible. SVGs are images, and every, any kind of content that you're going to use on a web page, you have to make it accessible if you can do it. One of the best articles, my favorite SVG articles, is this article by Leonie Watson, written for the SitePoint uh, website. It's about tips for creating accessible SVG. It's a must read. Seriously, if you're going to work with SVG, you have to read this article. Lots of great information. You just have to read it. Okay, and another thing is don't forget to optimize and degrade gracefully. Provide fallbacks. Now, SVG, uh, the slides here uh, by Todd Parker of the Filament Group are one of the best slides about SVG I've ever seen. They contain a complete workflow from starting with tips and tricks for creating SVGs and different SVG editors to exporting them, also tips and tricks, and uh, providing fallback tools for automating fallbacks. It's really awesome. If you are going to dig into SVG anytime soon, I recommend you do read these slides. They are excellent. And last but not least, if you need to know any about any browser support for an SVG um, feature, just visit caniuse.com and look the feature up. And thank you very much.